Hello, my name is John Cornicello and I welcome you to my series of live interactive photo conversations. You can check cornicello.com slash conversations for dates and times of upcoming shows and for recordings of previous shows. My guest today is Joao Carlos. Joao is an all around fashion advertising and fine art photographer and director. He splits his time between New York and Lisbon. He's won many international photography awards and is a brand ambassador for a variety of photo, photo suppliers. So please welcome Joao Carlos. Hello, hello, John, my hello. friend. How you doing? Very hello, good. Everybody. How are things over in Lisbon? Uh, things are great. You know, uh, fall has arrived. Unfortunately, I'm missing summer. I don't feel like I took advantage of the summer as much as I should have. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, things are going. Things are okay. No complaints. Yeah, so you're still going through COVID there. Yeah, well, we've we finally opened up uh, restrictions completely. Uh, bars opened up maybe three weeks ago. Uh, we've had our first soccer games and sports with um, with attendees back to normal. So for the most part, there's still some limited restrictions, but we're we're pretty much back to normal. Yeah. So you got into photography at a pretty early age. Getting the camera yes, for your I'm, folks. I'm on maybe 23 or 24 years officially. Um, but when I was about six years old, the first um, first present I actually ever asked my mother for was a camera. And at the time, she gave me um, one of those disposable cameras, you know, like mm -hmm. the, the paper ones that's just a roll of film. And I looked at it and I'm like, Mommy, this is great, but. Um, it doesn't have a flash. I want a real, real camera. And I gave it back to her. <laughs> and then growing up, I'd always take my grandmother's um, Polaroid and I'd use that all around the house. And I, I, you know, go through cartridges like crazy. And, um, and then I was about 12. I had some cousins. I, I, I grew up in the States. So I, and I grew up between New York, Connecticut and New Jersey in the tri-state area. And Same here. Yep. And, uh, you know, my dad was a fisherman in the Long Island Sound. M my folks owned a restaurant, a Portuguese seafood restaurant, and we lived under the restaurant. So I, I'm like the younger kid in, you know, family of immigrants, um, first generation born there. And I ended up spending, I would say, somewhat some time on my own kind of figuring out life a lot. Uh, and, you know, that's, I think, where my passion is. And I'd spend my summers in Portugal on vacation. And I had a cousin of mine that she had an old VHS camcorder. And uh, we spent that summer making short films. So I, I've always kind of really been... Um, where was the know, restaurant? The restaurant was in Porchester. Okay, because I knew Newark, New Jersey had a lot of Portuguese restaurants. Yeah, we were in Porchester, right on the water. Nice. Yeah, it was beautiful. So from there to this year, you did a magazine cover for Fuji Love Magazine, right? The yeah, dancers? they um, they saw some of my work and I published some stuff with them before and they, they invited me to write a story. Um, and, you know, at the time, I had no idea it was going to be the cover. And it's always amazing when, um, you know, when they choose one of your images for the cover. So I'm really happy about that. Um, I think that's actually that series is up and going in there. So back when we met john i had just won the hasselblad masters mm -hmm. and um it's interesting now you know 10 12 years later i've switched to fuji completely so i had been shooting hasselblad and canon for many years and i switched over to fuji um and the guys over at fuji love magazine i think they only published images that that are shot on fujis so probably uh, <laughs> yeah i'm pretty sure <laughs> uh, but that's cool i i that was kind of i love photographing flowers uh, and I've got a series, all these different series of flowers images. And and I also love photographing dancers. And I, I kind of wanted to, I spoke with a designer friend of mine. And I gave her these images of flowers. And she based her designs on the, um, on the flowers. So the idea would be when the dancer would be, you know, in movement, that they would kind of look like a flower in uh, different poses and stuff. So mm -hmm. that was the idea. I'm not really sure how well I, I played it off. Um, <laughs> you able to screen share? Are you screen yeah. sharing? Yeah, let me do that. Uh, we're having trouble getting Jazz screen share to work, so I'm going to do it from Yeah, here. sorry about that, guys. We had a little bit of desktop. technical issues at the beginning. 
Here we go. Let me let people in. So where do you want to start here? Um, well, we can actually, since you were talking about these images, if you pull them down, I think I've got my Fuji Love in here. There we go. It's from that series of The Dancer. Is someone's sound coming through? If everyone can mute themselves except for Joe and I, that'd be great. Yeah, so uh, as you can see, the idea here was to use really flowy materials. Um, and as the dancer would move, the dress had a lot of layers to it and it would look like flowers. Um, some dresses were quite light, others were a little bit heavy. This dress is really heavy, the materials, so it didn't work as well. But um, I was still able to kind of use that to create the movement that I wanted. Um, again, makeup, I mean, it's, it's part of it. So it's sometimes I think we can't forget the details. And a long time ago, and I guess this is going to be my first little tip. Um, at my shoots, especially if it's a more creative shoot, uh, after I get lights and everything set up and, you know, we're going and there's a flow to it. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm usually going to do detailed shots of my model's makeup. And especially if it's more creative like this, I'm definitely going to go in there and do like a beautiful macro eye shot. Um, because I find that I used to forget about getting these detailed shots. And at the end of the shoot, my model was already so exhausted and the makeup was already so worn, you know, or from, from her, from the movement or from the lights, depending on what type of lights you were using, um, that it just didn't look good. So now I try to always get those shots right at the beginning when the makeup's still fresh. And, you know, like this, my makeup artist really always happy. Like sometimes for commercial jobs, the client has a really specific co concept and idea of what they want. And those images might not really be that great of an image for the makeup artist portfolio. So sometimes I will go and, you know, do that extra portrait for the makeup artist, even for myself. Yeah, so this is an amazing ballerina, Alyssa, from the Portuguese National Ballet. Um, she's actually Australian, and um, she's just amazing. So she's the same model in all of these outfits? In all of these outfits, yeah. yeah. So what are you lighting with? Um, currently a, a little bit of a mix. Um, brand wise or strobe? I mean, I, I use strobe LEDs. Um, so a mixture. So it's a little bit of a mix. Um, I've got lights from Westcott and light modifiers from Westcott. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I've also got lights, um, mostly lights and some modifiers from Profoto. Nice. Yeah. And then I've got like, you know, some older kit hanging around. This is a cool series here. So um, last year with COVID, obviously, like many of us, um, I, I lost a lot of work and, you know, commercially, my jobs weren't rebooked. They were just canceled. Um, a lot of them I wasn't able to get, get, um, you know, anything from, from having canceled shoots. So it was a bit rough. So instead of kind of freaking out and woe is me about life, I really turned to a lot of projects that I hadn't had a chance to, to work on before. Um, and these are my Portuguese queens. And I'm basically remaking um, paintings of uh, past Portuguese queens. So mm -hmm. it's a, a little bit different, um, but it's been quite interesting. This is your isolation series. Like yeah, this is my a lot more about this. Stages of isolation. Um, so I, I, this was the first work last year after about almost four months of um, not being in the studio and not photographing at all. I, I came back and I came back full of ideas and concepts and stuff. And this is one of the first projects that I did. So the stages of isolation, basically throughout the five weeks of isolation, um, we go through different um, emotions. Uh, anger, fear, uh, you know, doubt, uh, compromise, um, 
anxiety. So we're going through all these different emotions. And throughout the five, five weeks, there's like 14 to 15 different emotions. And I first did the first images with a friend of mine, model Fabrizia, um, the female model. And then I had the male model, uh, Rodrigo shoot. And it was really interesting because her images, they're all really soft. Um, actually, I didn't bring the full series here, but mm -hmm. um, if you guys want to check them out on my website, they're available. They're currently um, exhibited at a museum in the north of Portugal. They were in a gallery beforehand. Uh, and it, it's just been a really, really cool series. So, you know, I, I thought most of us, we saw a lot of images of people with masks on throughout the last two years. But mm -hmm. this is a way for me to show how our emotions were and how we kind of all felt. So you can tell when you're looking at all the images, the different range of emotions that go involved. Um, it was interesting because her, hers are all really kind of calm and pensive where his are, you know, he's screaming and he's, he's, um, he's a lot more emotional. But I think because I, I shot hers first and then I shot his images on a second day, you know, I, I was at a point where we were like um, disinfecting the studio. We still are, but like we were leaving days in between shoots, um, disinfecting before, after, during. Um, so, you know, this two or three days between the shoots here really got me to able to think and kind of mm -hmm. when I work with Rodrigo, um, I work the range of emotions a lot differently. So were this, is this Photoshop or did you have a prop built for them to be in? No, this is Photoshop. So um, I actually, at, this was at a previous studio that I have now. I, I usually have a big cube uh, that's painted black that I use for a lot of different things. So I put a, a piece of fabric on top of that and I've got a dome that's maybe about 30 inches tall. Um, and I went and I filled the dome in the exact you know size of the frame. I'm shooting on medium format. I photographed the dome. Um, with the same exact lighting to pick the dome away, put the model in that location, um, filled up the same space in the frame with the model uh, so that the proportions would be about correct mm -hmm. and then went and photographed that. Uh, I still ended up having to change the dome quite a bit. And it was like, we started off with different versions. Uh, one was a little bit fatter, one was a little bit shorter uh, and it ended up working with this, this yeah. final version. So going back to the Queen series, I got a question in the chat from Jim saying, how much did you recreate lighting implied by the paintings or how much did you like your models as you'd prefer? Uh, the lighting I tried to do pretty much as much as possible. So this series, and I think there's a bunch of them that I sent over, um, some images I'm based on, they're almost classic reproductions of what's there. Other images, because there either weren't a lot of reference or really good paintings of that, that queen, I've kind of had to re, recreate it a little bit. Um, so for example, on by the horses. So this queen here, this is quite, this image is quite faithful to the actual painting. Um, and it's been interesting, that whole process. Each one of them is a little bit different. And I guess because of the Queens, I now go and create, I've created two other series. So I've got a still life series that I've created because of um, the Queens. And then I also have um, a new series that I don't think I sent any over, but they're my latest posts up on, um, well, this series, for example, my Renaissance portraits. Um, so I'm, taking portraits of cats, dogs, and horses, and then uh, we're placing them in post into paintings. Uh, so I've, it's kind of spun off a whole bunch of different series that I think overall have kind of created a nice look and feel for my work. Um, you know, I've been at it in the industry for a long time and I don't think I've ever had a really specific style. Um, I think my style has been a little bit adaptive throughout the years, so. We got a lot going on in the chat room. Yeah, what do you want to take a look at here? Um, well, here's more of the animals. Here we go. Yeah, so the animals is pretty interesting. This was for a client. So they actually, I did a TV interview here on a Portuguese morning show uh, towards the beginning of the year. Like it was, I don't know, April or May. 
And um, a couple, they saw the show, they went and researched my images and they went and they had me shoot their dog and their dog is called Gishpar, Um And it, it's a name of a king. So they wanted to really kind of have that look and feel for him. Um, so it's been really fun seeing that I've, I'm able to turn personal work into work that's being shown in galleries and exhibitions. Um, and this has actually won me a series of awards, but also clients are now choosing the same style and look and feel to get their work done. And, you know, that, that's a, a process of kind of working a little bit towards what we want and our goals. Um, this was the first image in the series. Uh, and this is actually my makeup artist. It's her dog, Luna. And um, I, Luna was really used to, you know, like, for example, this is an actual collar that's around her. So some images they'll be wearing clothing and some images they're composited. Um, but I don't like to tell you which ones. <laughs> yeah, Luna was a really sweet dog. Let's see, you've got some circus and fire. One of my yeah, favorite so, subjects. Again, my work varies a lot. Um, but I usually say like the main three things that I shoot currently are probably going to be, I'm, I've always been a portrait photographer. And I think that's almost going back, almost not to the beginning, because at the beginning I was, I, I started shooting more photojournalism. Um but portraits have always been a really big essence. And I love shooting performers. Um, this is a performer where she's actually, not only does she do um, firework, but she also has other characters. Uh, she's got one character that she's like a, a, a giant cartoon character. And she does like, um, uh, what do they call it? In the streets, the sculptures that don't move. Pantomime type of sort of. Yeah. I know what you mean um and she's like european champion like her characters are really amazing and she studied at art school so she's building all of her props this was actually it's an almost direct shot um and this is really cool so this is a technique that she showed me what she does is she she creates really soapy water and then she takes the gas canisters like you'd use to uh you know with lighter fluid and she fills up the bubbles in the soapy water with lighter fluid. And then she then goes and sets that on fire. So because her hands are wet and because of the bubbles, um, she doesn't burn herself. And yes. yeah, this, this was shot in the studio. <laughs> Insane. Yes. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty much like one shot right there. Um, so you were talking about the redheads. Yeah, the ginger series. Yeah, so I a lot of my personal work, it all comes down to, you know, I, I think it's important um, as creatives and as professionals to constantly be experimenting, working on new things, um, and really putting out certain ideas, you know, and everybody's like, oh, you know, I don't have time for this, I don't have time for that, but some projects take me months or years to do, and some projects I can do in a morning or an afternoon. Um, I read an interesting article that 2% of the world's populations are gingers. And I discovered that there's a little town in Portugal that's named because there used to be a lot of gingers in that town. And, you know, I came up with an interesting name and I put out a shout out to social media and some modeling agencies. And I tried, you know, photographing people who were gingers. Um, so it's a, one of those things that are a work in progress. I actually need to, um schedule a couple of new shoots now um because i already have a lot of other gingers so it, it's interesting and each ginger is very different um and yeah this is diana i mean she's amazing her she's you know her hair's incredible um and she's a musician and an entertainer and a model and you know she's just been a pleasure to work with I actually i photographed her um for my queen series also because obviously, I mean, she just has that beautiful painterly type face. Oh, here's another dog. <laughs> Dogs in space. Yeah, so if you go to the next shot over, this is a close up. Here we go. Um, so during COVID, one of the things, you know, because I stopped and I kind of rethought and I was looking at my website and I, I came up with a, a branding for... I, I was looking at my work and I was photographing a lot of pets, a lot of animals, a lot of cats, dogs, and horses, but it really didn't fit into my regular 
fashion advertising website, you know? So I created a whole other brand called Star Paws. Um, and basically that's kind of how this all really started up. And this is one of the first images to really kind of, when I launched the website and kind of created the brand, this was that image for it. People in the audience have questions about any of these, please pop them into the chat or um, unmute and ask. But here, let me pull up another ginger here. So I hope, Jim, I hope that answered your question about the Queens. If you go onto my Instagram, one of the things that I've been doing is I've been um, in the Queens, for example, I post a before and after image, or I should say I, I post an image of the model and an image of the painting. And like this, you can see the references and, you know, some are quite similar, um, some not so much. Is this also a ginger? Uh, no, she's not a ginger. Couldn't quite tell um, it from this. It looks similar because I just yeah. love that background so much. <laughs> um, and I will say that I've, I've really used that background quite a bit. It's just, it's a giant size, great canvas that you can really use for anything. No, I love photographing dancers. And when you're using this cloud, or when you're using um, uh, flower, it just really creates some interesting shots. Let's see what we got here. Uh, yeah, this is an interesting campaign. Um, this was for a, um, a perfume company. And it actually, it was a, an Italian perfume company. The creative designer uh, who contacted me was a Portuguese guy. The model is from, um, I want to say, Angola, maybe some to my prince. The designer is from Cabo Verde. There's a big mix, but it, it had a lot of backlash when the brand, when the makeup, um, I'm sorry, when the perfume came out, it, it suffered a lot of backlash. And it was actually, the, the campaign itself was taken down about 48 hours after it was launched. But I always thought it was a really beautiful image. So... Uh, this is actually something that I've been doing lately that um, is quite nice is I've been photographing a lot of my friends who are painters, their artwork. Um, so it, I, I shoot this in like a multi um, uh, multi shift technique where I'm creating like 16 different frames on top of the image. And it, it takes an incredible amount of detail and it's a painting, but it's got like, so much detail that if you want to make prints afterwards on canvas, you can. And it, it's something that I've been doing now for a while. And it's been really fun uh, because it's given me a chance to meet other artists um, and, you know, create other connections there. This has given me an idea of photographing artists and having them paint on the print in their style over themselves. Well, there you go, John. Yeah. Thanks. That's it. See? <laughs> Boom. Uh, and this is one of those images. So can you zoom in? I think so. How far would it let us go? That's it, I think. Yeah. So uh, this is, I mean, this is a 400 gigabyte file originally when I take it. And here it's really important that, you know, in, in re recreating um, or capturing somebody's artwork, that the color, um, the tonality, contrast, everything is exact and perfect. So it, it's interesting that over the years, I kind of find myself going into more of a, a technical aspect. Yes, 400 gigabyte, that's what I said. <laughs> but it's, it's for quads inch mega. It's 400 megabyte. I'm sorry. Which is still a giant, yeah. <laughs> ginormous file. Wait a minute. Is this thing 400 megabytes or 400 gigabytes? Meg. 400 megabytes. So I, I shoot on a, a 100 megabyte camera, the GFX 100S. 
and it does a multi-shift technique um, that it basically just composited 16 raw images into one. And that creates this giant file with all of this information. Jim is so that, asking how you like the paintings. Um, so normally, I actually, I don't like using flash. Um, I, but if I'm going to use flash, normally I'll, I'll just use two lights at literally 45 degrees and make sure that there's zero shadows anywhere. Um, and I usually prefer like for this, for example, I don't use flash and it's just two continuous lights. So I'm, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I actually use my Profoto B10s just with the lamp there with the, the modeling know, light. light, modeling light on. And that was it. How do you uh, align the target part that you're shooting uh, to get um, to get it uh, perfectly horizontal, vertical, and so forth. Uh, well, that's interesting. So when I did this, this was on um, a tripod, and it was a little bit a pain in the ass to actually do that. So I had to go in afterwards and kind of straighten out some lines and stuff. Currently, I've actually redone a whole wall in my studio, where um, we created a wall. What do they call? Is it French French cleats? Um, so now basically I slide the painting on the wall so it's exactly straight uh, and then it makes it a lot easier for me to um, you know go into the camera now for example one of the things that I think I go back to when I was shooting with the Hasselblad I use my viewfinder with the grid that's got like I don't know what is it 16 lines or something so that everything is lined out and I'm making sure that all those corners and everything is lined up I also use on my tripod has a level in two different places and then i've got a usually a third level that i use on top of the camera i'll give you a hint about something um, the grid in the, the grid that's used in the hazard blood um, can move around and so those lines are i wouldn't use for anything but approximate um, reference i wouldn't use them for absolutely well no reference. that was that was in the old days the ones in my fuji don't move around anywhere can you change the? Can you change the? Um... It's it's digital, so they're not going anywhere. Wait a minute. Can you change the viewfinder screen? I on the Fuji can. or the Hasselblad? Yes. Well, on both. You can I'm change sorry? them on both, but I've in in both are would be digital. Doesn't matter if it's digital or not. If you can change those screens, they don't they don't align perfectly to horizontal or vertical, as opposed to uh, a bubble. How do I know? Because I used to do that for a living <laughs> years and years ago. <clears throat> no, what I'm saying is because I shoot in digital, they're not, you can change them, but they're not moving anywhere. They're, di they're digitally scribed on the, right. they're, not, they're not plastic pieces that you put in to replace. It, or glass. It, it's built into the camera as a digital projection onto the focusing screen. So you can't, you know, but you cannot change that. You can't change that grid. Well, can you change the grid in either one of those two cameras? Well, I mean, physically or electronically, you can you electronically can, change it, but not physically. Right, exactly. that so that's yes. all I was asking. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Yeah, the grids are, are electronic are, are entirely electronic. There's there's no physical grid. So let's move on here. Can you still see my screen? Yeah, yeah. 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 So this I think I've got a couple of other shots from the same series. Um, this was the first test with that camera. And I, I basically I just really wanted to see the detail and see how much information I can get from it. Um, and I was testing at a, a new makeup artist and I kind of wanted to see, you know, how far she could take it creatively. And, um, this is really what we came up with. Let's see if there's more from. So for example, the shot on the left next to it. Yeah, this is one of those cases where there's almost so too much detail. And for example, I only realized that the model had contact lenses after I looked <laughs> at this shot. 
even when I was that, it, that weird I pattern in the like, eyes. Yeah. This for me was kind of cool because the day of the shoot, I was really unsure of the light that I was going to use for this. And I actually ended up copying one of my own lights that I had done years ago beforehand, something that I had shot and I went back. So it's kind of cool. Like I, I, I usually say that it's hard to replicate anything because it's, you know, everything differs, you know, subject model, the skin tone of the model, the, um, the fabric that you're shooting with, whatever, you know, the car, the paint, everything has a different reflection. So no two lights can be exactly the same. Um, and I think this has been one of those cases where it was kind of interesting to look at my own work and kind of redo it and, uh, and kind of have that process. And Jeff, she was ask. asking a question that I had asked earlier before we started, if you know Karen Vasilis, but I don't think you, you did. No, I don't. We'll have to introduce you. Joe, let me ask, when yeah. you shoot um, a photograph like this, is it your distinct purpose only to shoot uh, essentially what is it, a headshot um, or and just shoot this series of a headshot? Or do you combine shooting more full length and so forth during the same session with the same model? Normally, I usually do. This is a it was all a beauty shoot. So the premises of the whole series was all just faces and different makeup looks. Um, for a portrait session, I do, you know, face, half body, full body. Um, as you can see in some of my queens, it'll be the same. Uh, it varies. But for example, go to the first image, John, of the, um, the person in the windsurfing. So for example, this is advertising. And when the client came to me, uh, it's an airline company, and they completely ended all non-reusable plastics aboard the airplane. Um, and they are the first airline company in the world to do this. So there was a huge waste that they calculated that they were having yearly. Um, so they basically wanted then, they did this you know, whole campaign to show awareness and they wanted to have six of their flight um, stewardess in different water sports. But then the locations had to look like they were in like the Caribbean and you know, and this was shot during the winter in Portugal. Um, so, we kind of figured out a pose that would work. And then I just worked that pose as much as possible. And I'm not thinking about doing a half shot or a full body or, um, you know, or a quarter shot. I'm just doing this one, one image and I'm trying to get as many different options as possible to create that one image. So it varies a little bit. Uh, so somebody said, what's the question? I don't know, Karen, she lives in San Stefan, okay. Um, hard to light for substantially different framing because lights and lighting modifiers can get in the way. I think that was referring to the full lens versus the headshots. Oh, um, well, not necessarily. I mean, again, it, it really, it's going to depend. Um, ideally, I don't want to get too tied up with my gear in that sense. So uh, we can get a little bit too pigeonholed so that the lighting is so... Um, it, it is directed in such a particular way and the strobes might be so close that um, that makes it difficult for a full body shot. But again, I prefer to know if I'm only doing a full body or if I have to do, you know, a portrait. Yeah. It, it helps. For those, who, for those who joined us late, we we're having trouble with Jao's share. So I'm sharing the images. So that's why we're not in any super special order. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. The isolation thing. But here's the another piece from isolation where we're talking about the difference yeah, for this series, I thought it was really important to have men and women kind of, um, I think all of us react in a different way to our um, surroundings and our environments and, you know, the way that isolation affects us. So it was interesting to have that play on him and her having these different emotions. So let's go look at the motorcycle. Yeah, so again, my work ranges a lot um, in a lot of, I like shooting a lot of different things. So what I've done over the years is I've kind of created either different websites or I've kind of tried to separate as much as possible. Um, 
I've got a couple of different clients in this area of motorcycles and cars. Um, over the years being here in Portugal, there's also a lot of film crews that come out and they're shooting commercials with cars. So they will might need an extra photographer to come on set um, and shoot stills for that. And, you know, this is for a local custom garage. Their space is amazing. And I basically just kind of, you know, moved around some of their stuff in there and, and um, photographed this beautiful, beautiful Honda. What's really cool is if you blow up the image, you can see on the gas tank, it's been all sculpted um, and it's got like koi fish and different images that are sculpted in there. Uh, I'm sorry, I said the gas tank, but I meant the actual engine itself. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, see the fish here. I guess you can't see my, yeah, you can see my cursor. Yeah. So again, it was, it was quite challenging and here the difficult thing is to really showcase all of the details in the motorcycle but at the same time kind of still keep that moodiness and environment to it and then the next one john we can maybe go in order here um this comes from a personal project of mine and it's been really really fun i mean i started off as a painter originally so i'm kind of going back to my roots here and this for me has been part of the process again. Um, so when we shot down for the second time with COVID, I, um, this is what I'm sorry, I'm answering. I'm reading somebody asking now about the flowers. And so this is one of the things that I'm shooting with flowers, vegetables, but because of COVID, I was still able to continue to shoot. So I, I kind of shot it before the Queens and then continued with the series. Um, and now it's kind of been a little bit of a work in progress. So each image has kind of evolved a little bit and I do enjoy, um, you know, creating the different setups, the moods. And I launched a online store to sell prints um, again, because my gallery had closed down and we weren't selling any prints via, you know, sales at the gallery. So I'm like, okay, I need to put up a store. And this is like the type of images that I'll showcase there. So it's, I'm targeting to slightly different audiences, you know, like this stuff and my horses, um, I'm selling to like hotels and Airbnbs and stuff like that for interiors. So I'm just curious, how long did it take you to set this one up? And I don't mean just the lighting. I mean, the total no, lighting was the easiest thing to set up yeah. here, but the total um, creation of it. Yeah. I don't know. It's a process. Um, I usually start off small and start building up. And then I look at it and I, you know, a couple of hours, maybe depending on the day, some days they don't work well and I, I'll be at it for like five or six hours and it'll look like crap. And then other days, everything will come together in half an hour. Um, this one was quite thought out, you know, even the process of, uh, sorry, John, That's even okay. the process of, of selecting the different fruits and vegetables. Um, for me, it's all about the different textures com coming together. And again, because I'm shooting on medium format, uh, and I don't mean to be like plugging so much gear, but I, I like to have all of this detail here so that you can blow it up really big. And it's interesting to see all of these textures blown up at that, that size, you know? Um, I can say that, for example, the inside of this pomegranate was really difficult and it took a lot of work in post to fix to make it look natural. When do you say enough is enough? <laughs> well, <laughs> I could see, see you keep throwing things in. <laughs> that's the whole thing with this series. It's all about that. I find that the ones that have less don't work as much. Um, so it's been interesting to really put it all out there. And again, since I'm shooting for myself, who cares? You know, Here's another this is one another of one of those from the advertising campaign. Um, so this is interesting because th this image for me is one of my favorites. I think the the stewardess, she's beautiful. Um, she's super elegant. Her smile is amazing. Uh, I think the wave and the formation of the wave that I got was incredible. However, I got a lot of um, negative feedback and I don't mind talk talking about it because I hope other people can learn from my lesson. 
is her pose isn't exactly correct technically if she were going to be doing bodyboarding. So her hands should be the opposite direction. Um, and all of the pro bodyboarders out there were writing me on, you know, when, the, when this came out first time and they were giving me all kinds of crap for it. Um, but again, it's important that whatever subject matter we're going to be shooting, especially if you're in advertising and you have a tendency to shoot a lot of different things, is you try to find out as much as possible and speak with experts and see if, you know, little technical aspects of the image are correct or not. And this is one of those cases. Um, I just didn't have a better image of her in the other pose. And even, you know, done up in post and cutting here and cutting there, it, 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 this was the best shot. So uh, I like it. It's just technically not a proper bodyboard technique. So there you go. <laughs> and we didn't look at the individual horses here. Yeah, so this this is incredible. Like, I love photographing horses. I think they're such um, incredible animals. And I've, I've opted for doing something a little bit different where, you know, I like photographing horses as I would photograph people. Uh, so the idea of taking strobes onto location and, you know, taking a beautiful portrait of a horse um, is just really awesome. And there's a, a certain technique to it. One thing is it's really important that the ears are pointing forward in an upright position. Um, if they're not, if somebody's in the horse industry, they're not gonna like the image, it's gonna be a fail. Um, so it's one of those things, again, as you, as I progress in photographing a certain type of genre, uh, it gives me the ability to really know that better. You know, that's, that's a difference between being more of a specialist is that you know the little um, tricks of that type of area. This image, for example, it, it's won me a couple of awards, but in the Portuguese National Awards, it could have gone further than it did. And it drew up a lot of debate. Um, and the judges were going back and forth in the print awards because of the ears of this horse. And the reality is, is I think the expression tops that. And I think the expression is so incredible that it looks like it's like smiling and it's so calm that it, it the fact that the ears aren't completely pointed forward for me is kind of indifferent but at the time one of the judges was like no no horses have to have their ears forward so it goes back to is it about having a technically perfect image or is the emotion um the message that's being captured you know what's more important um and i, I personally think that there's got to be a bit of a balance and definitely in this case uh, i think the emotion trumps uh, the technicality of it Cool. Is there any other images you want to talk about here? Or do um, people in the audience have any questions that they want to? Yeah, go to the one in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the bell, sh in the bell uh, mm -hmm. glass bell. Down here? No, go back. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so this is a series I have called Stages of Isolation. And this was done during COVID, was it correct? Well, well, it was right after COVID. So it was like basically the first project that I shot when we can allow people to come back into our studios. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for those of you that have Facebook or Instagram, you can go on there and you can see I've got images and a video of um, in, in one of the exhibitions that I had. It was really nice because the lighting all, all came from above. So it matched the lighting of of um, that I basically used. Oh, you want to jump into the toolkit? So there well, is your I show you. Sure, want to start? It's just start here, or does it start the other end? No, it starts at the other end. This is actually the last one, which. Okay, so let's get. Here we go. Yeah, so people often ask about equipment, and we don't go heavy into equipment here, but we've got this presentation, so we'll talk about what you use. Yeah, I think it'll, um, you can run through me, no big deal. And basically this was like a really simple way. Everybody was asking me, what are you using? And I kind of wanted to break it down. Interesting enough, I need to do an update that because I finally updated my computer. Uh, and I think that's why I'm not, Zoom wasn't working. So sorry about that. Um, but yeah, I'm a Mac guy. So this little camera basically kind of changed my life. And I used to always be shooting with bigger, bulkier cameras. And when I kind of moved over to a smaller, I think I had a X100S. That was like the first one. And this is already like a third generation for me of that camera. Um, I like it just because it's small. So I 
think it's important that we always shoot. I think as pro photographers, um, I was coming to a point in my career where I was only shooting if my clients were um, giving me gigs, you know? And when I started creating a lot more personal projects about 10 or 12 years ago, I think that created a lot of other opportunities for me and it gave me the opportunity to grow. And some of those personal projects are as simple as, you know, me having a smaller camera on me during my trips and being able to go out and shoot. Um, this is the workhorse uh, of my shooting. I, I shoot with the GFX 50S and this is from one of my queen series. Um, what's interesting about this queen image uh, again, I'm using a reference. This was probably the second queen that I photographed. And she's not a really great copy of the painting. However, the image does look quite queenly. So, you know, it's been a learning process. Um, for me, part of it is really gathering all the different props and stuff that I quite like. Uh, yeah, so this is shot for Frank Muller. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's a high end watch brand and they wanted something to do with motorcycles and cafe racers and stuff. And what's interesting about that is again, I, I started off by shooting a buddy's motorcycle because I wanted to create some new content. I then went and had a motorcycle builder contact me to photograph his motorcycles. And now I've got major international watch brands that want to photograph their watches with motorcycles and they go and come to me. So it's been kind of interesting to see that process of how work has come. Um, camera wise, I'm sorry, using the 100 at GFX, it, it was a massive camera. It was, I mean, it, giant files, really beautiful um, because I was able to shoot stills and video. And so for example, they, not only did they ask for about 24 to 28 images and stills, but they also asked for a short, about minute and a half movie. Um, so I was able to shoot both of them practically at the same time. Yeah, this is my go-to lens. It's a 32 to 64. Uh, basically it's a 24 seven for the medium format. It, 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 uh, definitely primes have a little bit more details, but at the time I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't want to invest a lot. And I wanted something that would be very versatile and quality um, versus results. It was a great option. So there you go. The image, this is an amazing location in Portugal. Um, and it's really all shot with natural light. And she's just got a reflector giving her a little bit of a flow to kind of fill that. And this is kind of cool because I show you the same lens and this is why this lens is so great and so versatile, where I'm able to go and create different types of images. Um, the image on the right, does anybody recognize that? The red chair? No? Drawing no. blanks. <laughs> oh man, Chicago, Wrigley Field. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, there's a chair inside. Actually, I've got, I was, that for one of my press trips, I was at Wrigley Field and it was amazing because we got like a little bit of a special entrance. I was able to get an extra tour besides the normal tour. And um, it's always really cool. That happened to me in Salem also. Um, I was in Salem, Massachusetts on a press trip and that was pretty interesting. I'm getting a couple of questions in the chat too. There's some, some to me privately. We'll cover them in a few minutes. We'll sure. just go through this presentation and... Um, so again, client here, for example, for the Frank Mueller stuff. So they're asking me to shoot images uh, on location with motorcycles, but then they also want to shoot some images. Well, they didn't want to shoot. Uh, actually, I don't remember. I think originally they didn't want to shoot any images in the studio, but I had made a suggestion and they went for it. And, you know, I ended up doing, I think the three different watches like this in the studio. And this is the 120 macro. This is probably the lens that I use the most. Um, and again, here I'm shooting it for products. I'm shooting it, the image on the right um, cover for the travel magazine. That was our um, Barcelona issue, or maybe, you know, I'm sorry. It was our Madrid issue. And then the image on the left, that's a huge print. Um, that was for a gallery show. Um, and then I, again, these are two videos. 
Uh, and I do some video work. I do a lot of video work actually for a lot of camera and brand manufacturers. Um, I also do some video work, like some music videos and stuff like that. So uh, I opted for shooting medium format, most of my commercial work. And then I use the H1 and I think an X-T3 for a lot of my video stuff. Um, again, for video, it's a basic 16 to 55, you know, it's a 24 to 70 2.8 lens. Um, this is dancer videos that I've shot. It's just a really versatile lens. Uh, again, this from that other image that we saw previously, um, this is the X-T3. Again, it's a really fast camera. So when I'm shooting dancers, I'm not using normally my medium format camera. I want something a little bit quicker and faster. So I'm using this. Uh, this is a pancake lens. I mean, when I first switched over from Canon and Hasselblad to Fuji, um, this is what really got me is I wanted a really small lens that I can put on my X-T1 at the time and just walk around like a little tiny fixed lens street camera. So uh, it's just really versatile. This was in Mozambique and I was actually, I was down there photographing um, a commercial for a bank with one of Portugal's most famous singers. He's like Portugal's Eric Clapton. Um, he's like a blues and rock singer. Um, and it was a three week job. We were in Turkey, we were in Mozambique and we were here in Lisbon. And this was in Mozambique and we were down there in these different tribes and stuff, shooting the commercial with him. And I actually just took advantage to shoot the most that I could of my surroundings. And it was a really small lens that it's nice, not only because it's not a lot to walk around with, but, but it's not overly intrusive so that when you're being photographed, someone's being photographed by you, they're not overly intimidated by the gear that you have. And that's really why I've kind of, went for smaller gear over the years is because I was funding that my gear was being a little bit too intrusive. I have a quick question. Yeah, sure. Are these images that we're looking at, are they, are they marketing pieces or did you set this thing up to show an image with the lens and the description of the lens? Yeah, I said that at the beginning. So normally I, I do quite a bit of talks and um, a lot of photographers were always asking me about what gear and why I use certain gear. So I made this toolkit to make it easier to explain. No, oh, but is, 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 is Fuji using any of, any of this stuff to do their, to do their marketing and, and uh, No, editorials? this is not an official Fuji um, gear list. As we go through it, you'll find other brands. And on, on the images here, these were not shot for this piece or for Fuji. These are jobs uh, or other things. No, but I have shot. Well, uh, that's not true, actually. The H1 was shot for Fuji, one of the videos that was there. Mm -hmm. I actually shot a video for them. Um, but it, it varies. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, this on the right was for, um, she's a, Portuguese TV host and she was going to Portuguese Fashion Week. Um, so she was creating a lot of content for Fashion Week and all the new designers. So we shot that during Fashion Week. And then the image on the left is for a beauty editorial. Um, this, for example, it's the 90 beautiful lens. Um, and the image that's actually that I use is a uh, advertise or uh, well, yeah, I could say advertising, but it's a lookbook. So it's a, you know, fashion lookbook for a client. Uh, this is another performer. She's a burlesque performer. Um, and this is just really cool. Again, I love creating these crazy sets in the studio. And then this is on location. He's a barber. Um, obviously, you can tell by the look. He's got a really great look and feel. And this I'm kind of pushing the limits of what you can really do with a wide angle lens. But I know a lot of people say that you're not supposed to do this and supposed to do that in photography. And I think, you know, I think you need to do what works best for you. So I'm, I'm shooting with a wider angle portraits that supposedly you're not supposed to do, but I think it works. Um, so that's kind of why I show these. And this is more on the creative end, which is really fun. Um, this is an editorial for a magazine. And it's nice because the effect that's created on the image is actually created 
via a lens so it's organic and it's not um you know photoshop filters or it's the actual lens that creates this effect and the lens babies they're really cool and you know they're adaptable for a lot of different cameras uh these are the triggers i guess we can run by these or yeah, pass yes. by these but these are for my pro photo lights so over the years i've opted for having mostly portable lights um, even in the studio, I prefer to have a battery powered light so that I don't have all these extra cables around when I don't need them. Um, and this is Portugal's first wrestler, um, Killer Kelly. And this is cool thing about this was actually one of those situations where when, when I realized that Portugal had a wrestler at like WWE and, and she was here on vacation over the summer, I had to reach out to her. So growing up, I was from Stanford or I lived in Stanford for a while. Um, we lived in Portchester and Rye in New York and Stanford in Connecticut. And Sorry. that's when the guys from WWE used to come into my dad's restaurant. And in Stanford, that's their offices. So it's funny, you know, I used to love wrestling when I was a kid. Um, and I figured this would be kind of cool to photograph Portugal's first wrestler. So I'm using really raw lights here um, because I just want it harsh and, and have kind of a nitty gritty feel. Uh, this is Portugal's national um, uh, rock climber champion um, indoor. And um, yeah, I had a shoot with him and that was pretty cool. Something that I hadn't done before also. So um, this is for Nissan. Uh, it's campaign. It's actually for Infinity by Nissan. And it was one of the first campaigns where they had people also in their shots. Normally their campaigns are only of the cars. And I'm um, using a B1, uh, B1 uh, 500. But what's cool about this is I actually jerry rig uh, with suction cups my camera to the side of the car so that I'm able to get a little bit of motion. So it's, again, it's all really natural motion. Um, but because the camera and the model are connected with the car they're moving they're still and everything else has got that nice motion to feel so i'm not quite doing a panning uh but it's it's got that same effect uh motorcycles again i i was at a phase that was a little bit overly processed and this was one of those phases where i had like these crazy skies and you know everything was kind of overly processed but it's got a cool interesting look for it so uh, this is for the magazine and he's a Portuguese uh, TV presenter and actor. And again, a lot of times on the go, I just got to take a small little light and this is what I end up using. Uh, I do use it sometimes if I've got three or four other lights, I need to hide a light somewhere behind something or let's say in a car or you know behind a sofa or something, I'll hide one of these and, and just have that little extra light to give more depth to the image. Uh, again, we saw this image previously, and basically I'm just using this one light from above um, for her as my main light source. And it's really, it's a real simple, uh, beautiful light source. A lot of my queens have all been shot with this. And uh, I don't say I have a specific light modifier that I choose. However, I do have a tendency to really go back to certain things. And this is one of them. It really works well in almost all situations. Yeah, strip lights. I mean, everybody needs strip lights, you know. Um, I, I like the first storm was an asymmetrical strip light. Yes, and that's what this is right here. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's I like them a lot. So th I think they come in quite handy. Um, I end up having three different strips all the time, so I've got the two symmetric and the one, or the one asymmetric and the two symmetrical ones. Um, you know, this is if I'm not mistaken here, I'm using two lights. And um, these boots are waterproof and the client wanted to show that they were waterproof and or water resistant. And that, just to see the kind of the way that the drops flow from the boot um, thought was kind of cool and they liked it. And yeah, <laughs> very different from what they were expecting. And this this is just a reg regular strip. It, uh, I, I use this image because a lot of times we think, OK, strips are usually only for products. Um, or they're only for bottles and stuff like that. But this is a beautiful light created here for a portrait. And it's just one simple strip light. 
Um, this is an Octabank. It's interesting because it says it's a soft light, but her makeup here was very um, shiny and it doesn't look soft at all. Yeah, a lot of people don't re realize it's the, the subject determines how bright and shiny things are going to be as opposed yes. to the light. Oh, somebody's asking, interesting about the equestrian shooting something Karen also does. Do you shoot them in stables or arena? So I'll take giant cloths. And now we're talking about the, the horses. So it's a good time that I yeah. brought that up. Um, we'll take, I'll take a giant, you know, cloth. I actually sewed together um, these really two big fabrics. <clears throat> and then I'll either hang it on the side of a barn or if I have to, you know, I'll take big tripods and I'll, I'll, I'll put them up, but I do prefer to hang them. Um, and then I usually use just two lights like this and that's it. Cool. Hang on one second here. So I, I someone... like the halos because when you're out on location because of the wind and the halo is one full piece, it kind of reduces a little bit of the wind. If it were an umbrella, it would be too open and they've broken and flipped back and stuff. Um, and then I also find the octaves are a bit too heavy. So like this, I can just, you know, use these maybe with a pole and have two friends or two assistants to be able to walk around. And it, it's a lighter setup. So that's why I use the halo. Can we go back to that shot of the uh, water resistant uh, uh, shoe? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, 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 I'm always curious, but I'm, I mean, <laughs> that's I'm a good curious thing. about this. Um, I'm noticing somewhat of a trend that um, totally confuses me. Okay. In this, in this particular shot with the shoe, um, you're at f16 with a 100 millimeter lens. Yes. And yet, and yet, if if you go forward, um, John, it's actually a 120. I'm sorry. Go for, it's a it's a 120 macro. Yeah. Okay. But it, on, on, on what on uh, what size format? On a medium format. Okay. Uh, go forward, uh, uh, so John. My client wants the shoe in focus from the beginning to the end. And and here we're we're at f fourteen. Keep mm -hmm. going. Fourteen. Keep going. Ah. And now we're at f eleven. Yeah. So. <clears throat> buttons on ice cream. So the <laughs> horse is a lot thicker, depth wise, than the shoe and the women. And yet uh, you backed off from 14 to F11. Any reason? Yeah. So for example, here, I want it to fade off. Uh, the horse is going to have a little bit of out of focus from the back of the mane. For example, the shoe, I want it all in detail. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I can't tell you exactly why the girl's at 14. Usually, But the I shoe is only so much detail you can get beyond a certain f-stop. Yeah, but I'm also having, because of the, the water and the splash, I, I want to get all of that also. Okay. Um, so, for example, and I'm, I'm at these higher f-stops because I'm with the 120 macro lens. Uh, because if I'm at like a four, anything that's not his nose is going to be out of focus. So that's why with the medium format, I'm also using a little bit higher range here. But it's a look. Like, for example, this um, this was shot at the launch premiere of a movie. Um, and I've got the actors would come in. I do two or three shots and they go away. Um, fast, fast, fast. Um, so, you know, I, I ended up... I had some um, some stuff that was a bit at like, you know, 2.8 at four, and it was just so soft that my editors wasn't going to use it. So I, in this case, for example, and here again, that's all in focus. I'm at F29. Hmm.
I'm just going to kind of go through these. So again, if you go through my work, I mean, you notice that I've got a lot of different styles. Um, I think as a whole, it works quite well. Uh, but uh, I'm, you know, a little bit of a chameleon. I mean, working in markets, for example, where I work in Portugal, it's quite normal that a creative director is going to have all these different references and they're going to say, look, we want you to do this. Um, so that's why I think throughout the years I've been so versatile. Yeah, here's a 4.5 with the background going soft. Yeah. So I had a question coming from Valentina to me. What would you say to a starting portrait photographer? Wait, what would I say to a starting portrait photographer? Yeah, someone getting started. And Valentina, if you want to un unmute and clarify your question, please do. Well, interesting because we're on my gear part of this conversation, but I'd say it's not about the gear and it's all about your subjects. <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, definitely. Again, I break it down because I do quite a bit of talks and people are always asking all these different stuff. And I figured, well, you know, this is a good way to be able to go and show a comparison. You know, even from different bags um, and cases and stuff like that. I, I think commercially, I'm a bit, bit of a, um, a gear junkie. So I end up having all these different options. But again, I know like, my, my weaknesses are camera bags and tripods. I know, right? <laughs> But I will say, like, for example, if you go back, probably my yeah. favorite camera um, bag at the moment for a while now has been uh, the case. So I really like the hard case with the bag inside. Mm -hmm. um, those are all my preferred options at the moment. For years, I, I was using the airport takeoff because of all my travels. Now I'm not traveling so much, so I want my stuff a little bit, you know, um, and then Again, I'll take out smaller day bags. You know, I don't want to haul all my shit all over the place. Right. And then others, you know, basic stuff, camera straps. They also vary on the different cameras, memory solutions. Um, I go through a lot of hard drives with big camera formats and stuff. I don't erase anything. I save pretty much everything. And then... Um, these are like the little bit of extras that always come in handy. So for the portrait photographer, if you go back, John, real quick, that's an interesting toy. One more. The little extras here, the gadgets. So the Instax share, um, this is cool. I'm actually testing out a new one. And normally on my shoots, sorry guys, I was just grabbing this. So normally on my shoots, I'd go and I'd, um, for example, like I'm doing a portrait of someone, I'd pick out a portrait and then I'd stop go the and share I'd... so we can see you. Oh yeah, I'd go and I'd print out um, one of my shoots. So like I shot a model and I'd go and I'd make a printout of you know whatever. So I use the Instax. Uh, this is a larger format that I've been testing out, but these are really great. So even for the travel stuff that I was doing, every time I'd photograph a chef at a new hotel or at a restaurant. Um, Quickly during the deal, the dinner, I'd go and make a print. And at the end of the dinner, I'd go and I leave them that print. It's a really great way for people to kind of open up. Um, when I was in, in um, uh, Taipei, Taiwan, I did the same thing. And I'd be photographing people and I'd be like, hey, can I take your picture? And they'd be like, well, why? Well, I'll you know give you a picture of your picture. And I'd explain I'm a photographer, all these things. And this is a really great icebreaker. So it's one of those little things. And again, for me, it just takes me back to the old days when we were, you know, using using Polaroids to to check our our exposures and make sure everything was OK. Um, and it just goes back to printing. I was finding that I was having so much stuff that was shot on my phone, even that I wasn't just doing anything with it. So that's one of those helpful little gadgets right there. So, Jim, it is currently the based. What's I'm that? in Lisbon at the moment. I'm oh, sorry? Lisbon, Portugal. Jim mentioned a photo of the hills and clouds that seemed different than your on-brand work. I think that was this black and white here. So let me just bring yeah, that one so up again, again. I actually don't have any of my travel stuff on my website at the moment. Um, 
but I do have quite a lot of travel stuff. I mean, I've, I've, um, I can show you a blackboard over here. I've been to about 52 countries and I had a camera in about 30 of those. But it's, it's just, again, my focus or my core has always been more the commercial side of things. Um, so you don't see so much of that. Any other questions? Here, I'm just gonna bring up a couple of photos here. Going back to the last time we saw each other here. I think this was in 2016. <laughs> and before that, 2012 in Peter Hurley's studio. For oh, this was amazing. So actually John's got the trigger in his hand and he's taking that picture right there. We're very imaginative in our posing for all these pictures, <laughs> at least with the thumbs up. <laughs> uh, you weren't so smiley in this one though. Oh, you're pretty serious here. Here we go. Here we go. That's Trying more to match on each brand other right there. there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I used to be a lot more smiley too. I'm a little bit more off brand at the moment. So a couple of people joined us late, Stephen, in June. I don't know if you have any questions or anything you want to ask or say. Um, I haven't I heard will, enough yet to ask questions. <laughs> I, I will point out that I do indeed have the Hasselblad Masters oh. edition from 2010. You uh, haven't opened it, though. Oh, no, it's open. Oh, it is open. Okay, sorry. Oh, sure. from, yeah, it's it, just it, plastic cover on it. Oh, yes. even, even more special. <laughs> If I were, if, I, if, if, if you were here, I would certainly have you sign it. And there I you go. So wait, how, how long have you had that for you? I probably had it for six years or something, eight years. Okay. I didn't buy it. Uh, I didn't start collecting the master's editions until they had been out a few times, few issues. And then I went back and started buying all of them. Uh, okay, cool. Nice. Yeah. So I've got all six. I actually <laughs> just got number one, maybe six months ago. Is that a skip yeah, that's cone? with August Bradley on the cover. That's correct. Yes. Is, is that a skip cone thing, or is that directly from Hasselblad? Uh, it was no. Uh, Hasselblad did it, but the uh, the publisher was Telenews. Yeah, I mean that's the this is the award for winning the Hasselblad Masters book is you get your work and pu published in Tenoises and distributed throughout the world. Yeah, and you you I. I You've got the cover photo on this one, and I just saw that there is actually another cover photo edition of yours. So, uh, they yeah, it's interesting enough. I actually have two, two. So the other cover never came out. That was never produced. Oh, really? I just, I just found one on eBay and bought it as we were talking. No, you won't. When you, when it arrives, it'll be the exact same cover that you have. Well, that's fine too. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost it, certain because it's a new one, and mine is, um, mine is used. If, if it's not, then I'm going to have to go and look for it because I've never seen it. Well, I'll let you know. But I do know the image that's on it. And yeah. interesting enough, um, when they were designing the layout, they had three different cover options and two of them were with my images, which was amazing, obviously. Really? I mean, it really is, you know, people asking all the time. It's about luck. Somebody liked them and they chose those images. It had that, you know, graphic look and feel and pop to it that just worked yeah and the photographs your photographs in the edition itself are very very breathtaking and and there's a lot of them i, I was <laughs> you got a big spread yes thank you yeah those images it's interesting that's actually from a series so i work a lot of my personal work is all in series as you guys have noticed throughout the talk and they're all quite romantic and in this case um it's my love tragedies so I go and I recreate different love tragedies throughout history, uh, but some of them are real, some of them are fictional. Um, some of them are known, you know, like Bonnie and Clyde or Samson and Delilah or Romeo and Juliet. Um, or then I go and I, I you know, I did, uh, um, oh, what's it called? Um, the Tim Burton movie, uh, The Corpse Bride. So I've, you know, as a series, they're individually they're all very different looking images but as a series they they kind of come together um it's it's interesting looking back at a body of work that's already 12 years old um it's so it's it's kind of cool 
So yeah, next time, remind me where you're coming out of, Ian? I'm, I'm in Palm Springs, California. Okay, well, um, next time I'm in Palm Springs, California, I'll let you know. <laughs> have you gone to the Palm Christmas. Springs Photo Festival, Joe? I have in the past. I, I was there once before. Okay. Well, then there's um, a high I, likelihood we have run across each other. I usually just do it. Um, I've gone to the Palm Springs Festival in New York. Right, the, the portfolio reviews in New York. Yep. But you've gone to Palm Springs, too, for one. Uh, one. Do you remember about when that was? I want to say about 2014, 15. Okay, it's before my time there. But no, I would have been Brian's there. been involved. Yeah, with all of them. Yeah. I, um, I don't know. I think from 2012 on, I started doing a lot more stuff in Europe-based and then a lot more stuff in Asia-based. And in the States, I'd only go in and do maybe WPPI and then Photo Expo Plus in New York. I was there every year. I mean, that was my must-to show. But I was also in New York because I had a couple of clients that time of year that I also did projects for. So I'd come in and shoot for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, my stuff is really diverse. Like I'm thinking something that I could have brought that's very different um, that I don't ha have to show anywhere at the moment is recently uh, Portugal was the leading country for uh, something called the Porto Summit. So basically I was the official portrait uh, headshot photographer of all 27 European leaders. Um, and I photographed 90 people in 40 minutes. And so it was That's a little bit fun. insane. Oh yeah, super fun. Um, but again, that just to show how, how of a broad range of my work. That's why, I mean, currently, if you go into my website, you guys will notice that I've broken it down into multiple, almost different websites. You know, I've got my Star Paws, which is my pet photography, my Jean Carlos, which is more of my fashion and commercial. And then I've got um, its portrait, which I need to change, but it's more of like a headshot type, type setup. Mm -hmm. uh, I just found that it was easier to market myself like that. And again, that happened because of COVID. I mean, I didn't have the time to do that before. And with COVID, with all the downtime, I figured I might as well um, uh, needed to do that. I'm laughing here. Sorry, guys. I get distracted <laughs> with the chat comments. And Jeff says I need to shoot more cats. Interesting <laughs> enough, Jeff, I actually just finished this week a new series with some new amazing cats that are like mind-blowing, but I can't show them yet. I, um, I collaborate with an animal shelter. And I photographed their pets to create calendars that are then sold. And we try to, you know, um, bring in some, some help for them. And this year they've let me kind of do what I wanted to do. Uh, so I've just created a new series of images kind of along the line of my uh, reproductions of the old portraits. You uh, mentioned that you're doing some now online sales of images, prints and the like. How is that yeah. going and how are you doing that? So if you go here, do you want to go on my website real quick? Sure. Let me grab that up here. And I, I try to keep point. my website fairly up to date. And for those of you that are just joining in, um, you can look over my images, but I also suggest going over my blog. There are a lot of blog posts that do have information where I'm sharing um, how I created certain concepts or how I constructed certain images. And then here, if you go to my store, John, uh, where they store that you can find my physical products that I have at the moment. Is it going? Oh, it's just it taking a little to load. Yeah, it might be a little slow. So basically, I'm selling prints and books mostly. Uh, I'm I do have a t-shirt line in the works, but I've had a lot of I've had a t-shirt line in the works for like the last six years. So are you printing these yourself or are you having them printed? And No, I'm printed. I've, so I've got one of the companies that I work with, Coilab, um, here out of the north of Portugal. They do most of my printing as far as books go and some of the print products. And then I use another printer out of the UK. Mm -hmm. Are your limited edition prints all the same uh, edition? N number? Uh, same edition, different sizes. I actually what's, only do. What's the edition? So basically, I'm, I'm, I do editions of three. But I'm sorry. Um, 
I've got, it, it depends on the prints and some prints I'll have uh, larger editions, some are smaller, but total images comes out to about 20, but they're like four different sizes and different formats. Because I'm using different print qualities or uh, some might be, for example, printed on fine art paper where some will be printed on um, acrylic. Who's doing your acrylic work? Uh, it's a company out of the UK, Print Foundry. They do basically museum reproductions and stuff like that. Their printing and framing is superb. Great. Is there anything else you want to say, Joe? Um, no, it's just been a real pleasure to be here, John. I, I hope. Yeah, I'm, it's good to see you again. Sorry that it's I wasn't able to do the share from my end. Um, we'll figure it out. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just a pleasure to be able to show my work and, and share a little bit of what I'm doing. Um, oh, Joe, I, I really like your work. And um, I'll, I'll ask you the same question that I was asked when I was young uh, and had a diverse portfolio of a lot of different things. Well, uh, what do you really want to do when you grow up? Well, I think that's what I'm, what I'm doing now. First of all, thank you. Uh, Jeff, uh, I really appreciate it. Um, for me, I like the fact that Monday I'm shooting models, Tuesday I'm shooting cars, Wednesday I'm shooting horses, um, and Thursday I'm shooting some fine art. You know, uh, I, I've got projects that are short term, long term, medium term. Um, you know, I, I I would say that what I like to shoot the least is some of my client work, which obviously nobody really ever sees anywhere, um, but it pays my bills and it, you know, puts food on my plate. But in reality, I've been able to go and make it so that I'm able to make money a little bit off of everything that I shoot. So I can't really say, okay, when I grow up, I want to shoot this or that. Um, what I do know is I've always done personal work. I want to create more and more personal work. I want to work with more museums, more galleries, definitely on the fine art realm. But I do think there's a lot of commercial work that I, I like to do that I, you know, that I'm not doing. Um, no, some commercial work allows me certain creative freedom because you've got different budgets. Uh, and, and, you know, that makes it so that we can have different shoots or cool locations. So that helps too, you know? So do you have an agent, Currently, I don't. I've had agents in the past. Currently, I don't have an agent. So basically, you're sort of like a one on paper anchor doing all, all this stuff yourself. Um, what's that expression? I don't really know. One on paper hanger? Yeah. Well, you think about it. It's a visual thing. You know, think about it. More, no. If you're hanging wallpaper, arm. if you're hanging wallpaper and you only have one hand, <laughs> how the fuck do you hang wallpaper? So that's what the 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 phrase is. Yeah, it's a okay. an old well, phrase. I mean, well, let's you're busy. Know it. You're, you're just, very if busy. I shoot, if I were to shoot weddings every day, uh, I I you know I couldn't do it. If I were shooting the exact same thing every day, I think for me it's been a process. Um, I so early on in my career after school, um, to pay for school, I started working in the press as a press photographer, and I was doing mostly sports. Anything that I could shoot on the weekend for the newspaper, because I was going to school during the week, I'd shoot. And back in the day, they'd pay me something very little for the image that was chosen, but I got to use the film. I got to keep the film and you know use their film to practice. So it was a great way for me to gain a lot of experience. And then I started working for a photographer and he was a commercial advertising photographer. And I worked at his studio for about four years. And when I left his studio, I was working with the major advertising guy in the country I wasn't going to go shoot advertising and commercial. I mean, I didn't have the knowledge, the experience or the client list. And I wasn't going to go be, you know, tap into the clients that he was having that wasn't like that. So I actually ended up shooting a lot more fashion because there was a lot more creativity involved. And now over the years, I've been shooting less fashion because, well, I've got more experience and I want to make more money. So I started, started shooting more advertising. Um, but again, you know, I, I shoot my personal work and then I find that my clients kind of come to me because of that. 
that makes any sense. Yes. I think Jack wants to say something, no? I think he was talking to someone in the room. Oh. <laughs> um, so do we have any questions here in the chat box? It's all lit up, isn't it? Jeff is just commenting he likes your help save an ass book. Oh, yeah. So that would be something. I mean, that's something else that I try to do, um, you know, is I try to give back as much as possible. And for the help save an ass, I was photographing donkeys and, and we created the book and we did an exhibition and that was amazing. Um, for the Bianca, we did the calendars. This year we're doing calendars again. Uh, you know, I've done Toys for Tots in the past. I've done March of Dimes. I mean, any, any way that I can give back through my photography, um, I'm definitely gonna do it. This year, I, I, because I'm remembering, I wanna see if I can um, talk with the local help portrait and probably work with them. I know you've done some help portrait stuff in the past, haven't you, John? Yeah, I got started early on with with help portrait with um oh, what's his name down in Nashville. Um, yeah, just, Jeremy, Jeremy Howard. Uh, I don't know if they're still in existence as help portrait, but I, there's still a lot of people around the country, around the world, that are doing they the do free it. portraits for in December. Yeah. So somebody Jeff's asking how many projects. No, somebody was asking how many projects am I working on currently. Or, or next, not next. So right Tim now, I have the Queens is a work in progress. I haven't finished those because of the Queen series. I've started a new series that I'm two or three images in, which is the mistresses. So there were a lot of actual famous mistresses, um, and because of the research that I've done with the Queens, I've found that. So I'm started up a new series with them. Um, I've got so my the redhead. Queens and mistresses. Are they any specific country? Uh, Portugal. Oh, Portugal. Okay. Yeah, Portugal. Um, what made you settle in Portugal? My parents are Portuguese and my grandparents. Are they so, in Portugal or are they in the United States? Um, my folks now are in Portugal. Yeah, but they've beautiful they've also country. Been, been back and forth. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, I've I've visited twice. It's it's just. Uh, it's a photographer's paradise for shooting some of my favorite it, pictures. Well, you know, it's funny is that I was living in New York. I was always coming to Portugal to shoot on location. And now that I'm living here, all my clients are asking me to shoot in studio. <laughs> so I think what I need to change about at this point is shooting more, more stuff outside like I used to do. Yeah, but Por Porto in, uh, in Portugal is, is just one of my favorite cities. And one of my favorite, actually, uh, Jay Maisel pictures that I got from him was a picture that he shot in Portugal. In Portugal. Uh, yeah, his white and black doves. Um, just. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm familiar. Um, yeah. I mean, Porto is just, the whole country is just beautiful. Yeah. I, I should start organizing some um, photography trips out here. Yeah, it's, it's easy to get to uh, from the U.S. I mean, because it's so Great. close, you know, it's... Um, and it's just an easy country to get around. Uh, we spent some time up in the wine country uh, one year and uh, uh, we had two long visits there and it's just been great. Uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I love it. I actually go to Porto next week for a job um, and it's, it's always nice. But again, Portugal, see, I think my photography is very much like Portugal. If, if you have a chance to visit the country, you notice from North to South, it's very different. And you can find in a country that's so small, everything from mountains to beaches. Um, so the, the, it, the, it's really quite dramatic, the change in landscape that you have here. And that's what's brought a lot of commercial advertising um, companies have come to Portugal to shoot a lot of commercials and stuff because of that and film groups. Actually, the next Game of Thrones is being shot um, here in Portugal. And it's actually a location that I've shot there at least two or three times. Um, so it, it's, it's really cool in that sense that there's so many where, diverse, where in Sintra. <laughs> oh, Sintra. Oh, wonderful. So, oh, um, that makes sense. The castle so, and yeah. yeah. So who has the book? I'm sorry. I think it was, uh, Jeff he, just said she, Jeff? he bought the book. Yeah. If Jeff opens up the book, well, the image of the cover of the book that that shot. And I think one of the locations that they'll be using. 
And Jim was I, asking if there's in the chat if there's any differences between the queens and mistresses in terms of lighting and clothing and the overall look. Yes. And what happens is it was interesting. So for the queens with the wardrobe, I actually found a person who she does um, medieval festivals and she makes her living creating wardrobe to rent out to medieval festivals. Obviously, all the events were canceled over the last year. And she was like, you know, she had all of this stock that she wasn't doing anything with. So I asked her to loan me three dresses to make one image. She loved the results. And from there, it's just been like this beautiful collaboration. And she's now actually, she's customized some dresses for specific images. Other dresses have been made um, uh, on purpose. But at some point, her, her dresses really don't fit any of the queens that I have to do. And she's got some really crazy kind of 19th century dresses that just worked really well for the mistresses. So the mistresses are going to have slightly different wardrobe. Um, and then lighting is a little different. And then it's more about the attitude. Um, the queens are very proper and the stance is very all proper where the mistresses are a bit, um, well, loose. yes, loose would be a good word. <laughs> very cool. I have the book. I just didn't answer because my gardener was trimming a bush outside my window. <laughs> uh, yeah, but on some of the locations, that's where they'll be shooting Games of Thrones. Very cool. Well, I want to thank you, Joe, for joining us today. I know it's the evening for you there. I don't know if you've had dinner yet. No, Give dinner will be next. It's Sounds all good. good. Um, oh, thank you so, again, everybody. And John, is this going to be available after for anyone who wants to? Yes, yeah, so I'll um, put it up on YouTube by tomorrow. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, so John, that out. Yes. John, what, when do you get into Monterey? On um, Monday, Monday morning, or Monday around noon. Cool. Here, let me end the, the chat here I, or just close the, the, close the recording. Facebook. Thank you, everybody, and I'll catch you soon. And, uh, Thank you very much. This was wonderful.